And VDR is in general uh, involved in skeletal metabolism. A lot of our patients develop osteoporosis. Is involved in modulation of immune response and is involved in regulation of cell profilation and differentiation. And so when we look at the VDR polymorphisms in 185 ME-CFS patients, we see that uh, in the control groups for both uh, polymorphisms, there are more people that in fact are high responders uh, in the controls than in the patients. So the, there's, a, there's a substantial um, less amount of people who are high responders uh, to uh, GCMAF. And we see that there is substantial increase in the uh, subgroup of patients with, that are low responders uh, to uh, the, the GCMAF. So it's the same for both, uh, uh, for both polymorphisms. So this is something I take into account when uh, we are going to give GCMAF to patients, uh, whether they are uh, low responders or high responders. Uh, and uh, Dr. Cheney has a whole theory about uh, why this comes from and why Africans uh, are, um, are more high responders and, and, and Norwegians and Scandinavians are more low responders, but uh, that all still needs to be proven. So what is the rationale for uh, the use of GCMAF in a MECFS? Both GCMAF and LPS activate macrophages using a specific mechanism. That means the mechanism is different. So um, we know that GCMAF uh, activates the, the macrophages, but LPS does so too. A majority of ME-CFS patients has increased bacterial transfection from the gut to the blood. It's not only us who has proved that. My, my, my fellow Belgian Maas has also showed in several publications that there are uh, increased antibodies uh, and in, of, of in, intestinal bacteria in the blood of CFS patients. Also, we look at a product uh, from macrophages um, that is, in fact, released when uh, it comes in contact with LPS, and that's soluble CD14. We know that um, uh, in CFS patients, soluble 14 is higher than normal in the peripheral circulation. And when we compare the normal population, it's, it's clearly increased. It's one of the things we look at uh, in routinely. LPS stimulation of macrophages leads to production of nitric oxide. So everybody knows uh, Mar Martin Paul and, and the whole story about CFS and, and, and O, the, the production of a, a, a very strong free radical, which is proxynitrate. But it also leads to cholestasis. And if you have cholestasis, you're going to have digestive problems. You're going to have like uh, a slowing of the of the peristaltis. Uh, there's less um, there is less gall coming into your your digestive tract and so on. There's lots of other changes that we've observed recently. There is an interference with MRP2, and it is multiple resistance protein too. And this is also involved in MECFS. It, it's too long of a story today, I'm not going to uh, talk about it, but it's something uh, uh, we'll publish also soon. And there's a lot of control of redox status uh, in, in MECFS patients. So also GCMAF stimulates uh, macrophages, but through another mechanism than LPS, without the direct negative effects at the lower concentration LPS. So we, we know that uh, GCMAF is in fact a stronger activator of macrophages than LPS and it does it in a different way without uh, certain cytokine expressions. LPS and GCMAF are unable to stimulate the, the macrophages simultaneously. So it's either LPS or GCMAF. The affinity of macrophages for GCMAF is much higher than for LPS, so that's good. Administrating exogenous GCMAF will result in suppression of the LPS-related macrophage activation, and thus will GCMAF induce a good phagocytosis without the bad IL-1 and alpha-TNF release. So that's, in fact, the, the basis uh, for giving uh, or for 
for what we use now in compassionate use, uh, GCMAF, because of this competition uh, of LPS in activating the macrophages. So the conclusion is the bad macrophage activation by LPS is diminished or abolished, I'd rather say diminished, competitively by competitive action of GCMAF in the macrophages. So uh, we've treated much more than 108 patients, but I haven't had time to uh, calculate exact results. But in, in, in the first uh, months and, 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 and even the first year uh, when we used GCMAF and compassionate use, uh, the rationale was that they had to have some uh, retroviral activity. And we took patients that where we found some evidence of retroviral activity. And so uh, these 108 patients, they were given 100 nanogram in one milliliter of physiological serum. Now to know what 100 nanogram is, uh, a nanogram is 10 to the ninth. So what we're giving is one ten thousandth of a milligram. That's just a few thousand particles. I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely low. It can be given IV or subcutaneously. There is discussion amongst researchers what is the best? Well, what we do is we give it the first time IV and see what happens, how pe people react to it, but then people do it themselves uh, with an insulin, insulin needle and, and syringe and they administer themselves. And the dosage uh, depends on, uh, in fact, how activated the immune system is and uh, what kind of responder they are genetically. So uh, we select them to even uh, if, if they are low responders and they have um, uh, low activation of complement and so on, so we risk to give 100 nanograms, otherwise we give much lower dose. About three-fourths of this group, which was the first group, had the full dose. The duration of treatment was 5 to 40 weeks with an average of uh, 15 weeks. So we were really astonished in the group that reported uh, improvement it was 68 out of 108, so between 60 and 70 percent. And uh, when we look at the uh, seven major symptoms that we were interested in, fatigue, uh, uh, sleep quality, pain, uh, neurocognitive function, recovering, uh, less payback, uh, um, this is an Australian, mainly used in, Aust in our Australian group, or the static intolerance and digestive problems, we see that there is uh, more than half of the, of the patient recover have uh, really uh, diminishing symptoms. And in fact, we defined that the people that got better if they had at least uh, two of those symptoms that uh, uh, improved. So for this uh, uh, symptom, not all the patients report the symptom at the onset of a treatment, so uh, this uh, number is obviously lower. So what is the risk of GCMAF administration in CFSME? It's actually, GCMAF is a natural substance. I mean, it's a natural substance. It's something we, as normal people, healthy people, we, we produce. Uh, our immune system makes it out of, um, out of GC. And uh, we know that uh, if there's T cell activation in patients with a Th1 to Th2 shift, so uh, mainly Th2, there, and also Th17, there's theoretical risk develop or increase autoimmune disorders. So um, my, my colleagues say, you know, um, you, you, you give this uh, in, in, a, in compassionate use, but you risk to have more autoimmune disorders. I'll, I'll comment th about that in a minute. Uh, we had no cases in these 108 patients of uh, developing autoimmune disease. Uh, it's been now almost a year, and we haven't seen any uh, autoimmune disease. Normally, in my large cohort of patients we follow, uh, we, we have about 4,000 patient contacts per year. Uh, we have a few people who uh, develop autoimmune thyroiditis, which is completely normal in this group. Uh, and so this year I had two patients with autoimmune thyroiditis, which does not fall out of the normal group what we have normally. So with patients with increased TGF beta, which uh, 
uh, activates at the age 17, people with in high IL-6 and high titers of ANA or thyroid antibodies, uh, we uh, temporarily exclude them uh, from giving GCMAF until we know more about this. So what can happen if you overstimulate with GCMAF? You can get an iris. It's an immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And it also happened in the HIV patients that were treated with antiretrovirals. Uh, iris develops in some HIV-infected individuals soon after they begin antiretroviral uh, therapy. And of course, this is not just a, a big drama because these people are otherwise going to die if they don't get any, any treatment. So, I mean, nobody talks about this, but uh, some, some researchers have, have really looked at what iris is. And um, it's really, iris affects certain HIV-infected individuals whose immune system is heavily damaged by the virus and who have uh, uh, treated or undiagnosed AIDS-associated infections. That means we, um, we, we see something similar in, in, in our uh, patients um, because uh, we, our patients also have uh, infections. So when these individuals, these HIV patients, start uh, antiviral therapy and their immune cells start to regenerate, the immune system unexpectedly produces an exaggerated response that unmarks or worsens symptoms of the co-infections. So in fact, uh, this is uh, not related directly to the GCMAF, but is related to the fact uh, that these patients have significant amounts of co-infections. Production of uh, repopulating T cells in mice clearly facilitated development of experimentally induced iris. So uh, from the animal uh, model, uh, it's hypothesized that it's really uh, this mechanism that is responsible for this iris. So in our experience, uh, 20 or 30 percent of our GC muff treated patients have some light form or heavier form of iris, and uh, it's more present in those with activated T cells and with low number of T cells. People with very low number of T cells are more affected with disease, and they have more co-infections. And uh, what we do is we monitor for iris with uh, cytokines with C4A, uh, which is a co complement activated T cells, C25 and HLDR plus. And also, uh, as a prevention, or when we see uh, minor forms or uh, severe forms of iris, uh, we do a broad screening of associated infections, fungal, viral, intercellular bacteria, and parasites. And we, we now start with a low dose. Initially, I was advised by the Yamamoto group uh, who had uh, experience in, in HIV and in cancer patients. Uh, and um, they said there was no side effects. Well, uh, there is some iris of, uh, in, in our patients. Um, and so we now uh, systematically start with a, a lower dose and titrate it up uh, slowly because we can still miss uh, significant um, infections. And I must say, in, in, in uh, seven patients where we had iris, I found an active Babesia infection, uh, which is in fact uh, not so common. So, um, how does the uh, GCMAF treatment uh, influences the negalase activity? Again, I don't have so many um, uh, patients yet. Uh, it's, it's evolving. I will have results on, on, on probably another 50 or 60 in the next weeks. But uh, at this moment, we had only 18. And so, uh, in these 18 patients, the mean was 2.5. It goes down on the average to 1.87 after 12 weeks. Uh, and we see that in 15 out of the 18 patients, the nagalase activity dropped compared to the pretreatment. In one, it stayed the same. And in two, it was slightly elevated compared to the pre-situation. So, but in, 18 out of, in 15 out of 18 patients, there was a, a drop in, in. This is too early to do, draw any conclusions from or do any statistics but we will uh, 
do that in the next uh, next weeks.